estate planning. How old do you have to be to do this? Even if you are a teenager in your 20s or 30s, should you be encouraging your parents to do this? An estate planning attorney, Kim McAdoo, will be joining me in a minute to discuss this. Also in this program, I'll be chatting with a Brooklyn High School student whose dream of becoming a pilot has now airborne him to flying a plane. Well, he's not landing as yet, but you'll learn more about this when I chat with him. You've got one of these devices. You can call a family member or a friend or someone else and tell them to watch this program. We begin with estate planning. And uh, estate planning attorney, Kim McAdoo, welcome to Brooklyn 45. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. I'm going to ask you the obvious question and uh, a question which a lot of people don't have an answer to. What is estate planning? Oh, wow. <laughs> we could spend a whole hour on that topic alone. Um, <laughs> just in short, estate planning is a way to manage your assets during your lifetime and especially after you pass away. Um, and the reason why you know I really am passionate about estate planning is that it's really um, a great way to transfer wealth between generations. And uh, who is estate planning for? You did say while you were alive, preparing for when you pass away, but who should this be directed to? I mean, the easy answer is anyone over 18. <laughs> um, but certainly, um, if you are, you know, if you just had a child, you know, at any major life event, you should be planning your estate. And especially, especially if you own property, like a home or an apartment or that kind of thing. But you do not actually have to own property, do you? No, not always. So um, estate planning is not just about the assets. And I think a lot of times we think that, that it is. It's really about the people in your life. Um, so, for example, I have a child with autism. You know, I, I have to do a certain type of estate planning for him specifically. And, you know, that involves money, you know, but it also involves you know, setting him up for success. That really is the point with estate planning. Um, you want to set your family up for success, you know, moving forward in the future. You've got a child with autism. And uh, there are many parents who've got special needs children. Um, what should they be considering when they are planning estate planning? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so I, I like to think of it as almost like three pillars, and especially as a child gets older. Um, and I'm talking about, you know, after high school, let's say, you want to plan, you know, number one, you know, what is your child going to be doing or where are they going to be living, you know, after high school, it's a very personal choice. Some of us have families who can, um, really step in and help support us. And some of us have to um, come up with other things to do. Um, and then number two, you know, who's gonna be responsible? That would be guardianship. Um, that's also something that we do. Um, and, you know, we've seen it where people haven't done that and maybe they pass away and they have a child who's 30 something and there's no guardian. So that's really, really important. And another thing is, you know, what resources um, is your child going to be able to enjoy you know, and that's where we get into some of the supplemental needs, planning, like special needs trust and all of those kind of things. So there's a lot to consider um, if you have a child who has a significant disability. You're leaving assets to your child. Not um, directly. <laughs> <laughs> right, not, not directly. Um, I probably is a little too enthusiastic with that answer. Um, you're leaving assets on behalf of your child and the way that it works with a supplemental needs or a special needs trust um, is that you can you know, appoint someone to be in charge of those assets and they can spend them on behalf of your child. Now it's, I'm, I'm oversimplifying a, a little bit. It's, it's a lot more technical than that. But, you know, those are things that parents can do um, to set their children up for a, a life that they can enjoy and, and one that's healthy for them. What happens if the parent does not want family members to be aware of their assets and the assets that they're leaving to their children? 
Oh, that's a good question. Um, so we see that a lot in our practice. And so with your estate plan, it basically is a need to know basis, right? We, we often encourage our clients, you know, you need to at least tell someone that you have a plan. So if the time comes, they know what to do, they know what you have, you know, and all the details. But if you're not comfortable disclosing that information to everyone, you certainly should not be. So it's a very private thing. And again, we always caution our clients that they should limit the people that they give this information to. Estate planning, we hear about wills and we hear about trusts. Right. What's the difference between all these three? <laughs> the wills, trust, and so, I mean, I think by three, you could add um, um, not having anything in place at all. And in fact, um, most people who pass away in New York City, like 80 to 90 percent, don't have any type of estate planning in place. So that's number one. Um, their assets go through the court. If anybody knows where they are to begin with, <laughs> if anyone does anything or steps up, like it's questionable. Um, the next thing would be a will. And with the will is better than nothing, but your estate is still going to have to go through the court. And in fact, it's very similar to the first process I mentioned. Just again, the difference is that you can decide who gets what. And if you have minor children, you can nominate guardians in your will. And then you have a trust. And generally what people mean by trust is they mean like a living trust or a revocable trust because there are different types of trusts, right? Um, you know, you can, the, the basic type of trust, you know, you're going to be able to bypass the probate process. And trust can get as complex or as simple as, as you need them to be. I, I see a question already. Sure. What do you mean by probate? Oh, I'm skipping over. So probate um, is a term that we use interchangeably. Um, when someone dies without without a will, that's called an administration, but it still goes to the same type of court. Um, probate is when someone dies with the will and um, administration and probate or court proceedings. So, you know, a lot of the times it's un what we call uncontested, um, the family or whoever files, and it goes, it's basically a matter of, um, the judge reviewing the paperwork and granting, you know, the authority or whatever. But then you have the ones that are contested and that's full litigation. Like, you know, you're doing free child discovery, you're going to trial, you're doing depositions and that kind of thing. So, and it's hard to predict at the beginning of a case, which one of your cases is going to be contested. We see this every day because we also do the probate side of the practice. Um, and in fact, we have a number of, of um, clients that we have to approach from time to time and say, you know, hey, this case is becoming contested for one reason or another, right? So, <laughs> but, you know, I, I could go on and on about that. You know, the bottom line is that um, the process of going to court is to replace your signature. We like to call it a signature replacement because during your lifetime with your assets, like your home, if you wanted to sign it over to, your, you know, whomever, you could use your signature. If you passed away, then, you know, your signature is no longer available, and so a judge has to basically sign off on somebody else being able to replace your signature. Very often you said, okay. we have to do this and we have to do this. <laughs> Who is we? <laughs> um, well, I'm very lucky. I, I, I work with a number of people in my practice. Um, I have um, Scott, he's a CEO and he does like the business side you know, of the firm. And then we've been very lucky. We've been able to... Um, we've started working with an attorney. She's waiting to be admitted um, to practice in New York. And we actually met her through, you know, the office where we're, where, well, one of the offices where we're located. So I, I like to think of us as a we, even if I'm, you know, even when I was practicing by myself, because I like to think of the people who are in the community and our clients that we work with. And that's why I mean by we. You talked earlier about leaving assets to a minor. Yes. What advice do you give to people who may want to consider this? Oh, wow. That's a topic all by itself. <laughs> um, you, you want to, um, so a lot of times with minors, you're going to have two parents involved, whether they're married or divorced or whatever. And so, um, you know, physical custody is not such an issue. But if you haven't planned anything, um, custody of what we call the property is, you know, so for example, if you have, you know, a, a husband who passes away, he has nothing in place and only his name is on the house. 
Um, if they have a minor child, you know, say this is a married couple, the wife is going to get a portion of the house and the minor child is going to get a portion of the house. And the court is going to oversee the minor child's portion of the home. And so when you're planning for a minor child, you have to also think about who is going to be responsible for that child's property. And in the case that I mentioned, um, you know, the husband probably would have wanted his wife to have 100% of a deed to that house. Um, but under the law, if you have nothing in place, that's what happens. Your spouse and your child split it. You talk about husband, you talk about wife. What happens if people are divorced? Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> I can give you the lawyer answer. Sometimes it's better when people are divorced. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't say that out loud. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, when people are divorced and they're planning, I think that's even more important to be um, concrete and you know definite about what your intentions are. Um, especially if you have children in common or if you have a blended family or whatever, you know, because family comes in different configurations. Um, you just want to be, you want to have something in writing um, that clearly indicates your intent. You know, so we've seen it where um, we have some cases where couples are, they, they may still be each other's best friend and they'll come in with their children in common and one's planning, you know, one way and the other one's planning, you know, another way, but they're both planning for the same set of kids. You know, which is not everyone's case. <laughs> right? um, but you know the the point is is that you know you you want to put something in writing so that you so that you can keep the fighting to a minimum once you're no longer here, which is what a lot of parents they they quite frankly, you know fear that. And again, on the probate side or the court side of our practice, we see that quite often where um there's a lot of conflict among siblings, especially conflict siblings. <laughs> um, I'm sure lots of lots of parents who are watching this program can understand that. Yes. <laughs> How does one get started? They come to you. Yes, they can they come go, to me. <laughs> they go to an attorney. Who yes. do they go to? How do they get started? Um, they could um call our office and set up a consultation. Um. You know, and people have different ways of getting started. You know, very often when people come in for a consultation, they've already done some research. They've watched videos on TikTok. They've read articles or that kind of thing. Um, so people start to educate themselves typically before they come in. Um, you know, and with us, we actually have a three-step process where, you know, a consultation sounds kind of cold to me, quite frankly. I like to call it a conversation or a legacy planning session. And, um, you know, it's one of those things where we have a conversation and we get to know you, we get to know the people, you know, especially or about the people in your life first. And then we think about the assets, because I think for a lot of us, that's really what's most important. Um, and then if it works out, you know, then we'll have an engagement and we'll move forward with the plan. How long does all this take? Um, it depends on the person. Some people, we, I think we've done it in a week. Um, because we do have rush service available. Most people take about four to six weeks um, to get just everything together and that kind of thing. How does a person protect their assets when they're planning for the estate? Oh boy, <laughs> that's a really that's a really complex question. So it depends on what you mean by um, protecting the assets. So like if you think about um, Medicaid. A lot of people think about the Medicaid recovery, which is if Medicaid you know pays for your care during your lifetime, once you pass away, then the government can come after your assets after you passed away. So, wow. right, <laughs> yeah. So you, you may have heard about the five-year look back or Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. That's something that um, a lot of times people will put into place if they are in you know what we call their forever home, like they're not ever planning to move or sell the home or that kind of thing. Um, and then there are other types of asset protection too, which I could, could go into, um, you know, with a living trust, if you have it continue after your death, then there's asset protection for your children, for your loved ones, against lawsuits, against um, divorces. You know, it really depends on how things are executed. Is there a tax advantage to starting the estate planning process? Oh, tax advantage. Um, yes. 
Well, say I would say with like a, a living trust or a revocable trust, you would um, pay taxes the same way that you would, you know, just normally. I think with, and the reason for that, or I'm probably skipping over things. So, you know, in terms of a tax advantage, I think what most people mean, like after the first person dies and, you know, sharing like, or shifting the tax burden, the fact is, is that the exemption amounts with New York state um, in terms of taxes and with the federal exemption amounts, they're so high right now that for most people, that's not really, really relevant. Like if you're talking about um, tax advantages to estate planning, specifically for for a couple, you're looking at $13 million in terms of, terms of the New York state amount and the federal amount is probably somewhere around 26 million, 27 million. So those may come down. <laughs> <laughs> you know, depending on what Congress does, but you know, for now, that's where we are. Okay, and we're going to have to have you back to talk about wills okay. because there are so many people who have not done a will. Oh, and... okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So we are going to have uh, have you back to talk about wills and to talk some more about trusts. But... Certainly, I would love that. Okay, but. Uh, any final words uh, for our audience about estate planning? I say it's better to get started, you know, today, uh, because we've seen people procrastinate and um, they end up passing away. And then their families are coming to us for the probate, which is a much longer process. So um, it's just very important to get started. Okay. Estate planning attorney Kim McAdoo, thank you very much for being on Brooklyn 45 and sharing the information which you did. and. Uh, we are going to have you back at some point. Um, and uh, I know there's one other person who'd love to be on the program as well to talk about Will. So we'll have both of you on. That would be awesome. Will. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Kaden Merrin is a high school student here in Brooklyn and whose desire to become an airline pilot is not just a dream. Kaden, welcome to Brooklyn 45. Thank you for having me. When did you decide you wanted to be an airline pilot? Well, I wanted to be a pilot since I was a child. I used to always watch that in documentaries or planes. So um, I say I, I wanted to be a pilot since I was a little kid. I'm not going to say you, you still look as young as a child. <laughs> um, tell me, why? did you decide to become an airline pilot? Well, it was always a passion of mine when I was a little kid. Um, I used to always watch different documentaries, as I said. I, I used to watch the Sullenberg one. We used to land the plane into the Hudson River. And um, it, just, it used to always be a passion of mine. So where are you in accomplishing this dream? Well, right now, I'm trying to get my, fly, my flying lessons in. So lately, I only got two hours so far. But it's, I'm working on trying to get to a program so I can get more fly hours in. How many hours do you need? I've heard that I needed over 70 hours. Okay. Now, how do you get these hours? Well, I would well, I would um I would get to a flight program that helped me gain fly hours. So I can get my so first I can get my my private pilot lessons. And then after I get my my private pilot lessons, I can move on to commercial aircrafts and get my license for their company. Where are you practicing or where are you observing? I understand you are an intern. So are you an intern in a private plane or in a passenger plane, large passenger plane? In a, in a private plane. I'm sorry? In a private plane. In a private plane. Yeah. And uh, how many people on this plane when you do your lessons? It's just me and one other person. Hmm. Okay. How far do you travel? Where do you travel to? Uh, I don't travel too far. So I would usually take off at Farmingdale Aviation somewhere in Long Island, and then I would land somewhere at Connecticut. Uh, what are some of the challenges for you? achieving the goals that you have set? A challenge I do have is consistency because there's some days where I don't feel motivated, but there are also some days where I do feel really motivated to do what I want to do. You don't feel motivated some days. 
no, what? Like, I'm I'm saying like some like some days I could be really tired since my school days are long and very very tiring because they expect a lot out of me, which I completely understand. But at the same time, there I do have I do have some days where I feel dis disciplined and determined to keep moving on to my dream of being a pilot. You are at a high school in Brooklyn. What's that high school? I'm in Crystal Ray, Brooklyn. And uh, you go to school what five days a week? And when do you do your flying lessons? Um, I've only done I've only done one lesson so far. But right now, I'm looking into programs so I could do more. So um, I I guarantee I could do it. I could start by around either spring break or this summer. I understand that you had an IEP. You're going to explain what this IEP is um, throughout your elementary and middle school days. What is this IEP that you have been suffering from? Basically, an IEP is something that like, like they give you a special type of education that helps you learn in the easier way that's easier for you. It's something separate that some of the people do have. And it's something that I did have during elementary and middle school. Has this affected your achieving your goals? Um, I don't let it affect I don't I don't let it affect me. If anything, I use it to my um I I, I use it to my advantage. You use your what? I use my I use my IP like my extra help to an advantage. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I don't think less of it. I think of it as an opportunity for it to help me become what I want to be. Great. So what have you been doing differently so that you can achieve your graduation goals and your becoming a pilot goal? Well, I will study more. I will do more research. I will work on myself more as well as a person. Um. Yeah, I'll just work harder. You have spare time. You're studying. You yeah. are. Yeah. What What do you do during your spare time? Um. During, during my spare During my spare time, um, I would do research about planes and aviation sometimes. But I would also work out. I have a part time job at McDonald's. Um. I would also do. Um. I'll go to church. I'll help my grandma with some. Um, with some work. No. Yes, go on. Yeah, um, because over the summer I did help my grandfather with some um concrete work. Over the summer, I used to um do concrete work for his for, for his mother's house. That's not so. Basically, I'll do stuff that like help my family and stuff. Let's get back to you on the aircraft. What exactly do you do? Well, I would I would practice taxiing. So, so so taxiing is when you start driving to the um to the runway, and then I'll practice taking off. But I don't land yet though. But I'll, I'll get there soon. But basically, so far I'm just practicing on um, taking off, making sure the plane is flying straight, making sure it's not tilting or anything at full control. Basically, I'm just working on basically I'm working on control right now. Okay, I was watching a program the other night and uh, there was this guy who had never flown a plane before and he was being given instructions as he was flying the plane and he was told, as soon as your wheels touch the ground, you should apply the brakes. <laughs> what do you do when your, when your wheels hit the ground? Or I know that you are not landing as yet, but you still got to land somehow. Well, um, my instructor would land. My instructor would land for me, but at the same time, I would watch how he how he does do it. So, so I would take notes how he would lower the throttle. He would use the flaps stuff. That's like the basic mechanics things use. Um, yeah, yeah, he would he would use the brakes too, so he could slow it down, so he could slow the plane down. For sure. But I take notes of everything. Of everything. Okay, what does it feel like flying this plane? I'm not gonna lie to you. It feels like power. It feels like a it feels like it feels like a rush. Because at the same time, like like you're controlling that big machine in the air, so it feels like a rush. It feels like power. That's what I would say. But the rush doesn't scare you. It doesn't scare me, no. Okay, and uh, you're looking forward to being able to land the plane yourself. Yes, definitely.
what would you like the audience to know about you and uh, your dream? I want them to know that I'm working very hard right now. I'm trying. I'm trying to um, gain more discipline to keep my consistency going. Part of that challenge, and it's something I'm really looking forward to do earlier in my life, so I don't have to do it too late. And it's something that I'm very passionate about. All the students in your high school, they know that you want to become a pilot, and they know that you're actually practicing flying. Yes, they do know. What do they say to you? They are very impressed, too. They ask me if I could find some time. <laughs> well, um, I suppose in about 10 years or so, we may be on a plane that you are piloting. Yes? Probably less, but who knows? I love that. I love that. Caden Marin, a Brooklyn High School student uh, who hopes to be flying in a few years, not 10, in a few years. Congratulations, Caden. And we are happy to have you on Brooklyn 45 and the information that you have shared with our viewers. Thank you. Hi, my name is Crystal Rose, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the importance of the family structure and communities. So to begin there, I want to reference Dr. Miles Monroe, such an intelligent man, and he's written so many books that speak on so many topics relevant to the world we live in today. Dr. Miles Monroe identified that communities are made up of families. And so in the process of serving your community, in the process of being community driven and community led, it is vital to recognize the value and the contribution of families and the family structure. And so I do think it's important to make sure that our families are receiving adequate resources, support and services that keep them empowered and put them on a path to success. Without that, then our families will fail, our communities will fail, our state and cities will fail and so will our country. This is a domino effect. And so that is why family support programs and organizations that offer services and structure for the families are so vital. So I would say, let's just make sure we keep that in the forefront of our minds to highlight our families, support our families and keep our families together. <music>